Thank you, everybody, for coming to this um, event at the Monk Center. Um, the uh, last Soviet famine, 1946-47, um, mass hunger in, in war's aftermath. Um, today we have um, uh, a presentation given by uh, Philip Slavesky, who is a um, senior lecturer in Russian Soviet and East European history at Australian National University. He's the historian of the Soviet Empire, um, primarily of Russia and Ukraine. His work has focused on mass conflict and its aftermath, specifically the intersection of food crises, mass violence, and political control, and contemporary echoes. Um, he has um, a few books that he's published. Um, uh, a book that will be coming out very, very shortly, uh, co-authored with Yuri Shapoval, um, Stalin's liquidation game, the unlikely case of Alexander Shumsky, which will be published this year uh, by Harvard University Press, um, remaking Ukraine after World War II, the clash of central and local Soviet power, 1946 to 53, um, published by Cambridge University Press, and uh, his project on the famine is uh, a, a kind of a spin-off or, or, or a step uh, past that particular book. And uh, previously in 2013, the Soviet occupation of Germany, hunger, mass violence, and the struggle for peace, 1946-47, also by Cambridge University Press. He's the author of many articles as well. And uh, he is here today. Um, Thanks to a grant from the uh, and his project is being supported by a um, on the 1946-47 famine. It's being supported by the Australian Research Council Discovery Project. The last Soviet famine, 1946-47, drought and food crisis and war's aftermath. He's a lead researcher of a group of scholars uh, working on this project, which includes um, Professor Hiraki. Kurmia, who is also with us today. And uh, <clears throat> many of us uh, um, know Hiraki because he's been, um, I think, to Toronto before and uh, and is known uh, by uh, uh, scholars in Soviet and Ukrainian studies. Uh, he's a emeritus professor in the Department of History, a University of Indiana specialist on the Stalinist period, who has written on industrialization under Stalin, uh, Stalin and the Great Terror in the 1930s, and he's written a study of Stalin himself. His books that focus on Ukraine, uh, which um, most of us are very familiar with, is uh, Freedom and Terror in the Donbass, uh, Ukrainian-Russian Borderland, uh, 1870s to 19... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, 1990s. And the most recent book, uh, Conscious on Trial, the uh, fate of 14 uh, pacifists in Stalin's Ukraine, 1952 to 1953, by the University of Toronto Press. Uh, Professor Kurmia has also co-authored the um, Eurasian Triangle, Russia, the Caucasus, and Japan, uh, <clears throat> and has written many articles, including articles on the Holodomor. Um, and uh, my name is Bogdan Kleed. I'm director of research at uh, the Holdemore Research and Education Consortium, Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta, and I'll be moderating uh, today's session. Um, the, today's uh, event is sponsored by the Holdemore Research and Education Consortium at CIUS, the Peter Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine, and the Center for European Russian and Eurasia Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, I'll, we will have uh, two presentations, the first by uh, Phil, the second by Hiroaki, uh, and then I will um, briefly uh, add some comments of my own, and uh, I'll give the floor to Philip. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan, and uh, a special thanks to Marta and to Frank for, uh, for such a warm welcome. Uh, for us, for Hiraki and I in Toronto. I'm here to talk about the last Soviet famine in 1946 and 1947, which uh, was a terrible famine, uh, mostly on the areas now of Ukraine and Moldova, 
uh, but about which we know relatively little in comparison to other famines, particularly the Holodomor. It occurred in the wake of the terrible war where its consequences continue to unravel for many years afterwards, particularly in food crises and demographic crises and so forth. We know less about this famine for a number of reasons in comparison to others. Uh, the survivors of this famine remained behind the Iron Curtain after 1946 and 1947. Unlike survivors, or some survivors of the Holodomor, who as a result of the Second World War were able to emigrate to the West and, as you all well know, uh, raise awareness about uh, the earlier famine. It also occurred at a time where the Soviet Union was being more closed behind the Iron Curtain. There was a concerted campaign by the Soviet leadership to repress news of the famine and of broader food difficulties to the outside world. And to many contemporary observers, it was quite difficult to differentiate between the continuation of wartime problems and food crises with a distinct historical period known as famine. Probably in the late 80s, only when discussion about this famine became less taboo in the Soviet Union, and we saw the beginning of some publications, although these were minor, and much of the uh, scholarly attention of historians turned to the 1930s in the Soviet period and less toward the 1940s. Luckily, we're in a position now to learn a great more about this famine. The uh, relevant archival sources have been declassified greatly, mostly in Ukrainian archives. And although we started this project in 2019 at the beginning of COVID, and then the war has certainly complicated things, we've been able to continue our uh, studies in the archives through various means, uh, particularly in Ukraine and Moldova. So the, the famine's importance lies not only in, in itself of getting to know a period of history which is less known, but also because it occurs at a pivotal point uh, at the beginning of the Cold War, a pivotal, a pivotal point in the long aftermath of the Second World War, uh, and at a point where it would continue to exert significant influence on post-war Stalinism and the post-war Soviet Union, uh, the contours of which we're only beginning to understand with, with greater certainty now. What caused the famine? Well, there are many causes, and one of the major distinctions of our approach is to understand the causes of the famine, not only with the mass drought, which hits the southwestern part of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1946, but very much to go back from reconquest, from the Soviet reconquest of these territories from late 1943 throughout 1944. When the Soviets came back through, particularly through most areas of Ukraine in 1944, there was a general sense of optimism that these areas now would be able to feed the rest of the war effort and to alleviate the massive burden that had been placed on the non-occupied territories of the Soviet Union during the Second World War. So the intensity of the mass extraction of grain and resources from this area from 1944 to 1945 was unparalleled in Soviet history. In that period, we have 6 million tonnes of grain that is taken out from that southwestern region. There's little reinvestment into the agricultural sector, which has been destroyed through German and Romanian occupation and war. Rather, it's a fundamental attempt to extract as much as possible to alleviate uh, what's considered to be the burdens from uh, non-occupied areas, particularly in Russia, but also to fund the remainder of the war effort and to feed the army and to resume international exports of grain. This approach over these two years it delays, inhibits the uh, progress toward reconstructing these areas to recovering from the terrors of war and occupation. Particularly, we have massive demographic losses. Most of the people engaged in agriculture here are women, children and the elderly doing it by hand. Uh, massive losses of draft power of animals that would be useful, that necessary in agricultural production, but also basic things like agricultural work in tilling land and so forth, which are not engaged in in any serious way. Uh, and this approach of extraction without investment 
puts these places into a very difficult position by the time mass drought hits in the middle of 1946. And also the attitude toward the population here and the lack of concern over the food crisis which existed before the famine puts these people in a very poor position to deal with the famine when it occurs in 1946. So it's a much longer term problem of the Soviet approach from reconquest that's essential to understanding what sets the scene for famine in 1946. Unfortunately, many of the works that look at famine start with the drought, simply acknowledging wartime problems rather than these deeper issues uh, which we do. We should say something also about the Soviet approach or the approach of the leadership to war occupied territories. For many of us, looking at the history of the Second World War, we look at the genocidal occupation policies of the Germans across Ukraine, across parts of uh, Belarus and others, and it seems to us that this is an incredibly difficult period for these people. From Moscow, looking outwards during the war, although they were quite aware of the extent of these policies and the devastation to the people, the overall approach is that these people, through their labour, had been supporting the German uh, war effort rather than ours. And upon reconquest, the way in which these people could demonstrate their loyalty to the regime was to work harder now to support the war <laughs> through grain production to allow procurement. There was suspicion about their loyalties if they hadn't evacuated uh, before the German approach, which was mostly impossible given the speed, but nonetheless, and if they hadn't joined partisan rank to fight against them. So we have a situation where the Soviet approach upon reconquest is very much that of dealing with the conquered people uh, with little distinction, little pity or concern about their experiences beforehand. The confluence of this approach of the modus operandi of Soviet uh, policy toward the countryside of massive extraction, these sorts of things are important to understand as laying a foundation before we get to a problem of mass drought in 1946, which very much accelerates famine. Uh, what happens in the middle of 1946? It's not just that we have the worst drought in many years in this period, mostly along the steppe in Ukraine, uh, around the Black Sea coast, uh, worst affected oblasts are Ismail, uh, Odessa, and then the former Bessarabian parts uh, and the new uh, Moldovan uh, Socialist Republic. There's a, there's a severely affected by famine, but it's not just that we have a massive drought that causes famine, or well, that lays uh, the groundwork for famine. We have an interaction of human and of weather factors. Uh, this approach of massive extractions of grain and little concern for uh, reinvestments in agricultural work uh, and little concern for the people engaged in the collective farm sector mean that most collective farmers in these areas at this time, or many of them, weren't being paid for their work on the farms as they should have been. Many of them were in uh, a difficult state, that is the farms, and the amount of work expected was simply unrealizable and unachievable. So the uh, usual moors and usual timeframes of uh, agricultural work were being pushed out. The sowing in 1946, for instance, was delayed, was delayed partly due to the lack of draft power, all the while why Soviet plans were calling for the massive expansion of some area, which was simply unfeasible and unrealizable. When you push out the sowing areas, the sowing period, sorry, so the harvest was pushed out as well so that the harvest or the grain ripened later on the stalk right in the worst hot days of the drought, uh, which caused much of it to burn and caused much of it to fail. So here it's important to understand that it's not merely a question of severe weather that's, that, that explains the failed harvest in 1946, which is about half of the previous year in terms of grain production as far as we can see but also that the approach previously of the Soviet government, the interaction of these human and these weather factors have been important in explaining why the harvest is failed. When the harvest fails, there's much discussion in Moscow and in Kiev, particularly about what to do about it. Initially, it seems that Stalin entertained uh, the possibility of readjusting significantly grain procurement targets in line of what was expected to be a much less uh, level of grain production. Uh, there's a problem with this though, 
because when local Ukrainian experts send the revised grain production and grain procurement targets to Moscow, Stalin becomes very frustrated, saying that these are far, these are far too pessimistic, uh, that they're intended simply to keep grain within the country rather than to fund uh, the, the, the grain system. So although there is a modest reduction in the grain procurement target from about uh, 5.8, I think, from about six to about five million tons around there. Um, it's very much inconsequential because that target is still so wildly unrealistic. And what happens then is that in the attempt to meet this unrealistic target, we have a fantastic intensification of pressure on the Ukrainian system to procure these levels of grain, no matter what. Uh, Khrushchev and others attempt, at least in the middle of 1946, um, as is well known, to argue against this pressure, to say that simply the amount of grain that's being requested does not exist. But by September and October, they fall very much into line. And what is less well known is the way in which Khrushchev and the Ukrainian party machine are central to intensifying grain procurements towards the winter of 1946. Now, we have a situation where there's much less grain available and the amount procured is, although less than the previous year, is still a much higher percentage than, um, than then. So there's a, there's a much greater squeeze on the available resources. And this squeeze is occurring in places like Odessa, Ismail, uh, around there where the grain is being produced mostly, uh, but where much of it is less available given that this is the area that suffered most from the drought. Now, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, when it becomes clear that even these excessive procurements are not producing the amount of grain necessary to feed the rest of the Soviet Union, let alone for the people who live in the grain producing areas, Soviet regime decides that the only way to deal with this problem is to make people in the countryside eat less. So this is central to explaining why we have two major campaigns in September 1946. One is to reduce the size of the private plots of collective farmers, and the other is to economise bread, and that is to remove almost 30 million people from the bread ration entitlement in the Soviet Union, two and a half million in Ukraine. These are mostly... Uh, rural residents, but not engaged in collective farming. So uh, teachers, low-level officials, technical workers, and so forth. What happens now is at the very same time that the Soviet regime is extracting or procuring grain at such a fantastic rate, it's reducing the capacity of these people and the people living in the countryside to produce the food to compensate for this. So these dual movements of procurements, but also reducing the amount of available food and the capacity of people to produce it, are central to understanding why we have such a spread of famine in the urban areas. Sorry, in the rural areas and the grain producing areas. Uh, the idea was that the removal of these grain would, would as always, from the, uh, from the peasantry, would be to fund urban centres, the cities, but even in Ukraine and even in some places in Moldova and in Russia, the grain system's breaking down and we have high rates of urban mortality in these areas as well. It's not merely a case that the extraction is causing more problems for the peasantry, the failure to transport and distribute this grain, even for the favoured populations, the workers in the cities is failing and breaking down as well. And so this is why we have a situation where when we come to talk about mortality, most of the people dying are in the grain producing areas and the step that have been uh, have had their uh, produce removed. But this is where the majority of the population lives still in Ukraine as a rural country. But when we see the concentration of populations in urban areas and cities, the rates of mortality are very high. Uh, in these areas, what, why, what's the approach? How do we explain this fundamentally? This is very much the Soviet, Soviet method of operation. So even when it becomes clear through numerous uh, reports from the Soviet secret police to Stalin that the, uh, that the famine is a result of the mass mortality, that it is a serious famine, uh, these are ignored 
uh, and they're ignored because there's a fundamental sense among the leadership that the peasantry, as always, is hiding grain and that the failure, the reason for the low procurement targets are because the Soviet officials aren't either smart enough or brutal enough to recover it. And I'd like to show you some documents that can help us understand this, um, understand this mentality, if you will, and the way in which this type of thinking is central to explaining why Soviet policy is not only deeply inhumane and sort of wrong-headed and factually incorrect, but that it remains so regardless of the evidence presented to it, to the contrary. So this is a stenographic account of a Politburo meeting in late October 1946, where Khrushchev is speaking. Now, they hold five daily, uh, uh, sorry, meetings every five days at this point on the course of the uh, uh, grain procurement campaigns. Uh, and what they usually do is that they'll invite the uh, uh, OBCOM heads from the various oblasts to come. They'll sit and they'll discuss uh, the uh, the progress of the procurements. And what usually happens is that everyone screams at the OBCOM heads and, and you know, uh, for, for failing and so forth without reflecting, of course, on, on what they've done wrong. But of course, this is a, a sort of pantomime of what's happening through central uh, uh, relations with Moscow and Kiev, where, where Khrushchev, and others have to sit through and listen to Stalin's uh, uh, accusations around similar things. So we see the way in which the central pressure filters down to the to the level to the lower level. As you can see here in the highlighted areas, um, this is Khrushchev basically saying that we're in the, we're in a grain crisis. And there's not enough grain to go around, um, and his misassumption, his his misunderstanding, is to think that because uh, peasants in the south still have their private plots, which they're allowed through the collective farm system. They will live much better than those in the urban areas. Okay, he says that we've already removed so many recipients, urban recipients, from the rationing system. So that policy that I explained to you before. If we don't continue to take grain, they will starve. He says here we need to send more sharp edged people down to the countryside for better. Um, well, he says examinations, but for um, better uh, procurements. It's an interesting term. It's Lenin's favourite term in the 20s about the type of Bolshevik people that you need to send to the countryside. Uh, ruthless, smart, to be able to find the hidden grain and to take it without mercy. Now, Khrushchev starts to do this in early 19, uh, sorry, late 1946. Um, and then when Kaganovich comes to Ukraine in the spring 1947, all this intensifies. Okay. <laughs> now, were they aware? Let me bring into here. Were they aware that the actions that they were taking were resulting in hundreds of thousands of people dying? Absolutely. Did it dissuade them from undertaking these policies? No. Uh, this is a letter from uh, Lazar Kaganovich to Stalin in spring of 1947. On the left, it's a letter informing Stalin that almost a million Ukrainians are suffering from dystrophy. Dystrophy, it's a Soviet term, it has a scientific element, something like hunger edema, but it's also a politicized term, a way in which I guess the Soviets used it to divorce the political uh, aspects of explaining hunger to treat it merely as a medical problem. Um, the uh, symptoms of uh, dystrophy, hunger, edema, a great swelling of the either swelling of the of the of the stomach or or, or frailty, sort of the skeletal sort of look. And here, Kavorovich says that almost a million Ukrainians by this time are suffering from it. We know from the Ministry of Health that it was probably more. Um, in the countryside, they were unable to to even estimate how many people were there. What was happening is that given the lack of medical aid in the countryside, most people were going to the cities. They were swelling the cities. Uh, and this is another thing perhaps I forgot to discuss earlier when we were establishing the context of the famine. The famine occurs when the Soviet Union is at the height of its international prestige. It's one of the great big three victors. It's a superpower emerging. But at the same time, the Soviet regime is terrified that the masses of million, uh, millions of men demobilized from the army are returning to a countryside in famine. They're terrified that we know that there are thousands and thousands of letters being sent from families 
to their husbands who are returning, that their children are dying as a result of the famine, and the state are not supporting them. So we have a massive uh, concern that the return of these people, a possible Decembrist revolt occurring as well. In the Western Ukraine, we have a massive insurgency that's continuing, a Ukrainian nationalist insurgency against Soviet power. At the same time as that we have hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians flocking to Western Ukraine where the harvest was better, where it was not collectivized, and where more food was available. Security services continuing to complain to Stalin that what we're seeing is the possibility of more recruitment into the insurgency against Soviet power because of the famine and because of procurements. So not only do we have a problem where the Soviets are fully aware that the policies which they're instituting are causing uh, mass um, uh, uh, causing a, a sort of mass death, but at the same time, it's causing a serious or contributing to a serious security problem. Now, at this point, uh, much of the literature in the early 90s, although it's small, uh, through its understanding of brain statistics, came to the conclusion that the Soviet state possessed large millions of tonnes of grain, which it refused to distribute to the peasantry in order to teach it a lesson for its libertarian tendencies during the Second World War. So in the Second World War, in both occupied and non-occupied areas, there was a relaxation of central control, or an absence of central control in the occupied areas, where local, I guess, power was devolved to local economies to deal with um, the problems before them. They had to support the Red Army, they had to provide procurements, but there was little repressive control over the way in which collective farmers lived. So they tended to expand their private plots, they tended to produce their own food in addition to the state. This generally worked. And one of the reasons why if we try to explain the many factors that account for Soviet victories in World War II and the defense of the home front, this is something that needs to be taken into account. After the Second World War, the Soviet state attempts to reclaim control, central control, and reassert it over the countryside at the same time as the famine's occurring. The literature in the 90s had claimed that one of the reasons they withheld grain was to assist in this process. Of course, we've already demonstrated through our research, and particularly for members of our team earlier on, that this argument emerges from a fundamental misunderstanding of grain statistics. The Soviet regime did not hold large surpluses of grain which it refused to distribute. It was the opposite. It had already expended its mass, uh, it expended its reserves of grain. So by 1947, grain reserves were at the lowest point from 1941. And in fact, this was the problem. When we get to understanding what drove the Soviet leadership, we can read their Politburo discussions, their intimate discussions with one another, and you can see that the replenishment of these reserves is a major factor driving their procurement policy. They're terrified that they will become dependent on the peasantry again, as in previous times in Soviet history. They're very frightened that without replenishing their reserves, they'll be in a compromised security uh, situation, given the context that I've already explained to you. So they replenish these reserves regardless of the human cost. That is taking grain and food from people rather than allowing them to consume it so they can replenish those reserves, continue exports um, for their political aims to Western Europe, which continue all the way until the peak of the family in 1947, and also to fund the urban rationing systems. So here we have in the spring of 1947, Karganovich to Stalin telling him that we have a million people suffering from dystrophy and that we need aid. What's instructive about this is that Karganovich is in some ways much more intelligent than Pushchev in understanding how to deal with Stalin. He's not asking for aid for collective farmers, for the peasantry. He's asking for aid, what he says is for our people, that is rural people in the countryside, a million of them who have been taken off the bread ration for by a technical error, he says earlier in 1946. That is, school teachers, low-level officials, and others, essentially the backbone of Soviet control in the countryside. These people are suffering unnecessarily, he says, and we need aid for these people. So the question isn't aid and famine relief, it's how it's given and to whom it's given. Um, there's also, and we should say that here, Kaganovich says that we have hundreds of thousands of children that have been taken, as in the a lot of more, and given to state um, children's homes, and they're starving, and they need to be taken care of as well. That's asked for in the spring of 1947. Not much of that is given, 
Some of it is, and we can trace how much of it is given to certain groups. But the fundamental aid that is given, we can see in the handwritten uh, response to Kovanovic from one of Stalin's secretary. I'm not exactly sure whom this is. We have to uh, match the handwriting. Um, that as before, the aid that is given will be to those engaged in agricultural work. So the aid that is given to the countryside is given in the spring sowing period at the farms to those people who agree to engage in the spring sowing. And the aid that is given here is to those who report for work to harvest. So the fundamental um, response of the leadership to the famine is that by the peak of the famine in the spring of 1947 is to throw their hands up and say, we don't have any more grain to give. Now, that's partly true, but why? It's because the policies before, even when it became apparent that the failed harvest was severe, was to continue to expend grain. And the fundamental decision here made is that nothing can be done, really. The only thing that will save famine is a successful harvest in 1947. So rather than uh, being able to support people who are dying in their hundreds of thousands at this time in the spring of 1947, the peak of famine, the uh, response is to keep the grain and to uh, maintain that only strategic relief for the sowing in the hope that a successful harvest in 1947 will get them out of the situation. Luckily it did, but that was by no means guaranteed. If not for the successful harvest in 1947, the situation would have been far more catastrophic. Indeed, we know that even though that harvest was successful, starvation problems in the countryside continued for many months after it. I've only got a couple of minutes left before I pass on to Hero. But when we look at mortality and the number of people who died and how they died, it's a tricky situation because in terms of mortality that is registered, we have excellent records. That is how the Soviet state machinery was registering the number of people who died. But in the case of unregistered mortality, it's far more difficult. This is a society in flux. Uh, in the summer of 1946 alone at the Lviv trail railway station, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are picked up without uh, proper uh, travel documents and passports. So they're peasants who have fled from the south and the east. And there were many more who weren't picked up. So we have this massive uh, transfer of populations, mostly that's unregulated. The demobilization where you have people coming back to the countryside, seeing that it's no good, and then swelling the cities. And the big problem of peasants going to cities and living on the outskirts, the sort of shanty towns, looking for food and not being tended for because they're ineligible for their residence permits and because they don't have any ration cards. So how are these people counted? How are they when they die? We don't really know. In most cases, they wouldn't be. Those people who leave Ukraine, some people go to to the Kuban, to Central Asia, even in search of food. We don't know what happens to them. So in terms of the amount of people who are dying, in terms of the rates of people who are dying, of registered mortality, we can speak with great confidence. Um, for those who don't, it's far more difficult. If I show you one of our, we work with GIS maps to sort of map mortality as much as we can. And we can see that here, Moldova, um, Moldova is the worst affected region but so are the former Bessarabian parts that have been included into Ukraine, uh, Genitsi and, um, and Ismail, where about half a million people live. Um, the, the number of people dead in Ismail uh, tripled in 1947 compared to 1948. And in the absence of infectious diseases, the Ministry of Health conducts mortality evaluations at the time. Um, they're arguing that this is fundamentally due to, to starvation. The situation is different in other parts of Ukraine. Urban centers are squeezed in different areas, but here it's in the food growing uh, places that we see the mass, the mass of mortality. Um, again, Ukraine, this area moving into Moldova is severely affected, but other parts of the urban rationing system are strained significantly across the entire Soviet Union. Um, there's just some uh, conclusions. I mean, we. Uh, we're at the point where we've spent years researching this through the archives and we're writing up our uh, arguments and conclusions now through books and through articles. But fundamentally, we see uh, the famine as resulting from an interaction of numerous human 
and uh, environmental factors. And very much like previous famines in the Soviet Union, the modus operandi of the Soviet system is absolutely essential to understanding why famine occurs and why it spreads with such disastrous consequences. The specific relationship of uh, Russia, Soviet Russia and Ukraine after the Second World War is important to explaining some of the specificities of the Ukrainian case, particularly when we're talking about suspicions toward the peasantry, the intersections of mass insurgency, foreign and internal security problems as well, which are not present in other areas that are severely affected by famine like the moment. So these are things that we continue to work on, but I won't continue to go on the half hour that I've been speaking because uh, Hiroaki will uh, reflect more broadly on some of the questions about Stalin's role in the famine and broader, and broader issues before we move on to all that. But thank you for your attention. Uh, can someone get uh, Hiro's? Uh, yeah. Do you want to sit? <clears throat> Yes, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to start with Stalin because Stalin was the, the key figure in this event. I think most other events that took place uh, during the Stalin period. Now, uh, as uh, this outline said, in February 1946, he gave a speech, a very important speech, which some historians call the Declaration of World War Three. Uh, in that speech, he said um, to ensure that our motherland be ensured against all contingencies, which of course include wars, will need perhaps another three, five year plans, if not more. But it can be done and we must do it. Now, before Stalin said before this, we had three, five year plans before World War II and we won. If we have three or five year plans, we can beat the capitalist countries, including the United States. But the five year plan symbolized the hardships, suffering, sacrifice. So, according to Tucker, who was a, a, a diplomat in Moscow at that time, um, quote, a Russian in whose apartment I was sitting when starting the speech came over the radio, uh, lay his head on his folded arms when he heard these words, and he adds that he suspects, suspected that millions of other Soviet citizens did the same. Few months after the speech, he traveled to the South to Sochi for the first time in 10 years exactly what he route what route he took is not clear but given the railway network of the time he almost certainly went to the south through Haruki. and there according to his housekeeper who accompanied him to Sochi he was very upset when he saw that people were still living in dugouts and that everything was uh, Still in ruins. So she said he was already, he was uh, he witnessed uh, an unfolding uh, famine in the summer of 1946. I'm not sure whether Stalin was very upset, but it's certainly true that Stalin never flinched from exploiting the people, the people who had been exhausted by the war, and certainly he did not flinch from exploiting people in 1946-47, as Philip had just discussed. <clears throat> now this, um, as Philip said, Stalin was in good position in a sense. He was, he just came out as a victor, came out a victor from the war. Um, maybe great, Alliance, well, the future was not clear, but 
uh, in a sense, he was in good position. At the same time, he was not quite. Externally speaking, yes, there was an atomic bomb problem, atomic, atomic weapons problem. The United States had atomic weapons, the Soviet Union didn't. <laughs> Eastern Europe had not been uh, Sovietized. He wanted to Sovietize it, but wasn't yet. It needed a few more years. Internally speaking, it was also a very difficult time because millions of Red Army soldiers were coming back to see funny. Millions of Austrian arbiters were coming back. Uh, foreign POWs, millions, uh, Germans, Italians, Hungarians, Japanese, and so on. And then, of course, Ukrainian and Baltic, Baltic nationalists. All these people were sent to the Gulag or exiled, and even though they may have been isolated from normal civilian population of the country, in fact, there was a great deal of interaction between the ZEC and the civilians. So all kinds of sort of illicit non-Soviet ideas were exchanged and spread. And rather ironically, the Gula became a, a hotbed of illicit non-Soviet ideas. Stalin wanted to isolate from Soviet society. Now, Stalin did make concessions in dealing with the famine. If you look at the terror Stalin used in this famine, it's certainly much more limited than the terror he used to deal with the Holodomor more than 10 years ago. He did not use this famous blacklist shutting out the villages and colleges completely. Um, he also gave aid, not much, but did. He did uh, stop export at the height of the famine, not before, but after. But of course, as Philip just said, no, Stalin didn't, didn't make much concession at all. He didn't mellow at all. By the early 90s, after overcoming the famine, if he had been, so if he, if he had felt vulnerable, vulnerable politically in 1946-47, he appeared to have felt much stronger, much more confident by the early 1950s. He had atomic weapons, he had um, Sovietized Eastern Europe. He even let Kim Il-sung attack uh, South Korea and so on. But Stalin makes this uh, uh, remark to Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians visiting Moscow in 1952, a year before he died. Both the history of mankind knows many tragic examples in which entire nations have died off from food shortages to be buried in history forever. Well, we could say that he started had the, the luxury of being a uh, sort of pensive, which he didn't have at the time of the, the famine in 1946, 47. One of the reasons why he felt vulnerable at the time of the famine is of course the presence of Ukrainian nationalists working in Ukraine. In other words, in the Soviet Union, not outside the Soviet Union, as it, uh, mainly was the case before World War II. And here, the Galicia did matter, matter the most. As Philip said, million, not, maybe not millions, perhaps tens, hundreds, tens or hundreds of thousands of Eastern Ukrainians 
to, to travel to uh, Western Europe, Galicia, in search of food. And there, they understood how people live there, even relatively poor peasants, farmers. And here there is a very interesting book by a man called the Borodimir, uh, the Beehive, that I didn't know, it's not the Beehive, this which is Ukraine, published about 20 years in, in Crimea. He just goes there. He completely was struck by what he saw, and he becomes a sort of Ukrainian patriot, which he didn't really you know, which he wasn't before he went there. So the impact Western Ukraine had on these Eastern Ukrainians, we simply cannot underestimate. We looked a great deal of UPA when propaganda leaflets in the archives, and they are quite interesting. Because they developed a consistent, coherent critique of the Soviet regime. There are long, lots of points to make, but there are a few points I would like to make there. One is Ukraine's world. Ukraine is a fertile, rich country. Before the Soviets came, before the Bolsheviks came, Ukraine never knew famine. After the Soviets came, how many famines have we, have we had already? This is a hard one. Why? Second, yes, there was a drought. And the Soviets justified the, the shortage of food by drought. But they say, if you had known, if the Bolsheviks had known draft in 1946, why didn't they prepare? They had, you had plenty of time. Why they didn't? They even exported them to the spring of so 1947. Then they also developed this idea of colorful and surf, second surf, not new. Uh, but at the same time, they also called the Ukrainians to resist uh, the colorful system because you are the sons and daughters of the Cossacks. Freedom fighters, what? Why are you so submissive to to the Soviet authorities? Serve them. No, this is a, a second version of serfdom. Catherine the Second spread to to uh, Ukraine in the eighteenth century, and then finally Moscow as imperialist. Um, therefore, Ukraine has to be liberated from uh, Moscow's, Russia's, Yolk, Yermo, uh, the words they use very, very commonly. Now, these are nothing new, nothing new. But what's important is that this kind of uh, critique, this kind of propaganda really didn't uh, penetrate Soviet Ukraine. 1939, 1939, not, not quite starting really, no, controlled everything hard. But when the, during the war and the war, the war ended, this kind of propaganda spread, exposed uh, many, many Ukrainians to it. When we look at um, intercepted uh, letters by military censors, well, it's very difficult to tell the direct inference, the direct impact of Ukrainian nationalist propaganda on people. But there is quite a few overlaps. There is one more propaganda coming, right? And there we see what people are saying in these letters. And it's very difficult to imagine that there was no interaction, real interaction, there was no impact on the people. It's very difficult to believe that there was no impact at all. Short term impact was probably very limited. Grain procurement from Western Ukraine was very good. They used force, but uh, it was very good. So the power of the ONU's propaganda did not work in this sense, you know, in that particular respect. But in terms of uh, 
long time, in terms of long term impact, it's very, very significant to talk about, say, uh, Petros Elis' um, control of the Ukrainization, uh, revival of all the Cossack myths, myth, however controlled they may be. These are certainly threats to the sort of existence. But the point I'd like to emphasize is Sojanitu. And it's the uh, Archipelag Gulag. She praises the Ukrainian nationalists we had met in the Gulag. They are brave. They fight for their cause, even though Sojanitu was a staunch, staunch Russian nationalist. He was so impressed by Ukrainian nationalists. If Sojanitin had not had been influenced, impressed, wow, who, will, who, who would not be influenced by, <laughs> by them? So I think that uh, case is quite unattractive. At least I, I feel so. Starting in his late years, Stalin presented his, himself as a wise, old, wise man. In 1944, this is toward the end of the war, he told the Pope that 90%, he, he cannot say that 90% of the team and supported his government. In other words, he suggested, even in the Soviet Union, probably more than 10% of the population did not support the Soviet Union. That's more than 70 million people. What is starting to mean, really? How did he feel? In 1946, Chan Chin Kuo, Chiang kai son, who was married to Belarusian, he spent more than 10 years in the Soviet Union. Said, he told Chan Chin Kuo, it's difficult to know what the people think. If the opposition is not represented in the government through elections, it <laughs> will resort to illegal activities. <laughs> so he was very sort of resistant to the demand of um, those who wanted to control uh, China sort of single-handedly. So this, he pretended to be very uh, wise, but when it came to his own affair in the Soviet Union, he never followed his own advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Hiraki. Um, I, I'm, <clears throat> um, I'm not a member of the working group of studying the 46-47 panel, but want to thank them for inviting me to participate as a moderator in this session and for having the opportunity to meet and converse with them uh, beginning earlier this week. Um, I have studied the Holdemar or famine of uh, Ukraine in 1932-33, so I'm naturally interested in looking for similarities uh, between the two famines, and this is, uh, uh, and and my presentation is based on the discussions I had with um, my colleagues here um, the previous two days. Uh, before giving any specific examples, and this is what I want to focus my presentation on, is on similarities or parallels between the two famines. Uh, before giving specific examples, I'd like to start by making a couple of general observations on how to characterize mm -hmm. the two famines. Uh, if one looks at the size of the famine, uh, following the work of um, <clears throat> two specialists in famine studies, Stephen Devereaux and Paul Ho, in an article, uh, they wrote that great famines are those that whose number of deaths mm -hmm. exceed, reach or exceed 100,000. Whereas uh, famines, where the number of victims reach or exceed one million or more, the two authors labeled as catastrophic, about um, one million people um, and probably more died in the 1946-47 famine. Uh, from 1932-34 in Ukraine alone, the number of victims was about four million and about seven, I think, millions throughout the Soviet Union. So it's quite a large, it's, it's a larger famine, but they both fall 
within the care within that category if we want to use these terms. And I think it's useful to try to categorize them as catastrophic or near catastrophic in the case of uh, the 46, 47 famine. The second is that the two famines were both artificial. The um, mass deaths, the mass deaths from starvation were not <clears throat> outcomes of climatic factors, although the climatic factors were um, important uh, in 1946, that is the drought that had a significant impact on yields in southern Ukraine and Moldova. <clears throat> Climatic factors affected the yields then, but it was the decisions made or not made by Soviet government and party authorities that were decisive in causing the famines and mass starvation. Uh, maybe not the outbreak of famine, but the mass starvations in 1932-33, as well as in 1946-47. Um, <clears throat> If we look at examples of similarities, um, we can, can conclude that the um, unrealistic or excessively high procurement quotas assigned to Ukraine was an important factor in both famines. The um, resort to forceful methods to extract grain was, was present in both instances. And the collections to meet the grain procurement quotas in both famines took place in the context of significant declines in agricultural production on the eve of the famine, uh, on the eve of both famines, um, in fact, took place in crisis conditions. So um, <clears throat> if we also <clears throat> look at the immediate years before the famine, we see some parallels. Excessive extractions of grain occurred in Ukraine in 1930 and 1931 on the eve of the 1932-33 famine, and we see the same case in 1946-47. Another similarity which was mentioned uh, by Philip was the sending of uh, hardened or trustworthy, sharp-edged <laughs> uh, party members from urban centers uh, to the countryside to take part in the grain collection campaigns. And report to Stalin, um, that I read uh, just prior to coming to uh, Toronto, uh, there's a, a memo from Khrushchev to Stalin in February 47, mentioning that such party workers were sent to collect the farms and individual households to collect grain for the upcoming spring seeding campaign. So the collections took place not only to meet the procurement plans, but also to uh, get seed from um, Households and collective farms for the um, grain collection for, for, for the sowing campaign of 1947 because uh, the collective farms were short of seed, right? Uh, there were similarities related to the spring sowing campaigns of 46, 47, and 32. <clears throat> In 1932, the spring sowing campaign was uh, generally late. Uh, there was a shortage of uh, seed for sowing. Many collective worker and farm workers were weak from the lack of food and didn't or couldn't want, couldn't or didn't want to work. Uh, many in 1932 were all, already starving. There was a shortage of draft animals, which is similar, to, is, is a similarity in the 1946-47 uh, famine, uh, although for different reasons. And many were still, <clears throat> and many animals that were still alive in 1932 were not capable of working because they themselves were starving. <clears throat> Fields weren't prepared properly, as in 46, uh, for sowing, and many were infested with weeds. Um, also, many collective farmers hadn't been paid in 1931, which is similar to the case of the 46, 47 famine. Um, collective farmers were still being uh, were still being paid in kind for their labor, so what they earned was actually part of what ended up literally on the kitchen table or what did not end up on the kitchen table or could not end up on the kitchen table because they were not paid. There were problems during both famines in keeping farmers working and even on keeping them on the farms themselves. <clears throat> Another similarity was that exports of grain and other edible agricultural products took place during famine years and in the years leading up to famine. <clears throat> exports of grain reached high levels in 1930-31 in the years preceding the 32-33 famine. The amounts of grain fell to about 1.8 million tons in 1932 and about 1.7 in 33. 
during the famine itself. <clears throat> Grain exports occurred during the 46, 47 famine as mentioned. It was the, if we ask the question, how many people could be fed with grain rations for one year from 1.8 million tons, the amount exported in 1932, um, <clears throat> we can arrive at a figure of more than uh, 6.8 million, uh, a bread ration of about 700 grams per day. And with 700 grams of grain, one could easily cook a loaf of bread of about uh, 500 grams or more, considering that you lose a little bit of uh, grain during, you, you lose a little, little bit during the milling process. <clears throat> we uh, see more similarities uh, between the two famines. If we look at the de decisions and behavior of Communist Party and Soviet government leaders and officials. During the 46, 47 famine period, as well as in 32, 33, in Ukraine, party leaders and officials at the Republic and lower levels were being replaced or, or admonished for not carrying out directives or for poorly carrying out directives from their superiors for requesting aid and uh, reductions and for requesting reductions of grain procurement quotas assigned to their respective republics or lower level regions. At the republic level in 1946, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the first secretary of Ukraine's Communist Party and also head of the government, was humiliated, admonished, and even threatened by Stalin, who informed his subordinate that he had better carry out the communist directives without wavering or things could end up badly for him. In 1947, Khrushchev was replaced as Ukraine's party leader by Lazar Kaganovich, who was dispatched by Stalin to Ukraine to see that affairs in Ukraine were being run according to the Kremlin's directives. Khrushchev wrote a bit about this in his in a chapter in his memoirs. <clears throat> the leader of the Moldovian party was replaced with a more compliant figure already in the summer of 1946. <clears throat> if we compare what happened to the party and government leaders of the Ukrainian Republic during the 32-33 famine period, we can highlight the following. In June 32, Ukraine's leaders, Vlas Chubar, who headed Ukraine's government, and Hrhori Petrovsky, who was Ukraine's head of state, both members of Ukraine's Politburo, wrote to Stalin and Molotov, notifying them of famine conditions in the Republic. They requested the grain procurement quota for the upcoming 32 harvest be lowered, even though it was a bit lower than the previous year. Again, there's a parallel to the 40, to the situation that existed in 46, 47, uh, because there was a low, a, a slight lowering of the grain production quota. Uh, Stalin did not even bother to reply to Petrovsky or Chubar, but in a letter to Kagadovich, expressed his displeasure that the two Ukrainian leaders wrote and 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 uh, and then wrote subsequently to to Kaganovich that Shubar and Ukraine's first secretary, Stanislav Kusior, should be replaced. In January 33, Stalin sent Pavel Postashev to Ukraine to effectively run affairs, not as the first secretary, but as the second secretary. He was um, referred to um, anecdotally as uh, um, Ukraine's uh, second first secretary. Uh, the personnel moves by Stalin constituted in late 1932 and early 33, the imposition of more direct Kremlin rule over the Republic. Another similarity in both famines is the Republic level officials in Ukraine assigned blame for their failures to meet the grain collection quotas on their subordinates. The lower level officials were admonished, removed from their posts, some purged and some were even arrested as was the case in 1932-33, although the repressions were much more severe in the 32-33. Uh, there are other um, parallels that one can make. There was the, um, I mentioned the swelling of the cities, peasants trying to get to the cities, which occurred in 32, 33 in search of food. Migrations took place, not to Western Ukraine as in 46, 47, but migrations in 32 tended to go north to Belarus and to Russia, and as well to the Caucasus area for, for brain. Again, this is, um, one has to look at famines, what happens during famines worldwide uh, when there's a shortage of food, people tend to go where they think or they know where food is available and this is what occurred. I'll end my comments there. Um, 
and uh, we'll open the um, floor to questions first from the uh, people here, uh, that is uh, the in-person crowd here, and then we'll open it up to online. We need to hear comments. Would they have, oh, right? Or would you would you want to comment first, uh, or, or maybe anything else that you might want to add, or maybe comment on what I've said? Well, we could do so through the responses to the questions as well. Okay. Would be nice to speak to people. <laughs> Okay, okay the, uh, could you train? Yeah, uh, was occupied by the Germans from the summer of 1941 to, I believe, early 1944. So the uh, Germany was in control of uh, food distribution and production. Uh, did the uh, German authority cause anything similar to what happened in 1946-47 with the uh, food distribution of some uh, shortages? And the second question is, uh, it is known uh, that after the war in Ukraine, there was a very significant armed resistance against the Soviet uh, authorities. Uh, how did that uh, famine impact that resistance? Uh, we, we know well now that uh, the German hunger plan, uh, not only in Ukraine, but in Belarus and its occupied areas, was uh, anticipating uh, massive famine. In fact, it was working towards it. Um, imagining that what they called surplus populations would die off because there were too many people living there and this would be a suitable place for German colonial expansion. Uh, so yes, absolutely, we have a massive it was a genocidal policy. This has a huge impact on available food because most of the food that's being produced or a large portion of it is being sent back uh, to Germany and to other areas. Um, the initial plans of the Germans to liberate the collective farm system. After a while, they returned to all former collective farms because they realized too that it's establishing control over the production and distribution. So yeah, that and that the impact of that, I think, in terms of the amount of people who died as a result of hunger and other complications is an ongoing project. Um, but of course, it's not merely the occupation, it's the retreat. So the massive um, scorched earth policies initiated by the Germans from 1943 onward. It's anti-partisan warfare that burned uh, to the ground so many villages, um, that stole uh, so much livestock. Um, I mean, the, for instance, the Romanians in the in 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 the Caucasus, sorry, in um, uh, in in the south in the steppe, they they took so much livestock that the Romanian government asked them to stop sending it because they couldn't deal with it. With the numbers from these areas, so the 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 wartime experience um, absolutely sets the scene. But it's important to remember that uh, the NKGB did these um, uh, analyses of conditions under German Romania occupation for peasants and the current conditions on the side. <laughs> and of course, um, the procurement targets from the Romanians were lower than the Soviets. So <laughs> yes, it's it. You're absolutely right. It, it's it's a massive. I mean, we're talking about millions of people who were dead and displaced, uh, and this. But what's important to remember in in terms of reconquest and the impact on agricultural production, it can be as severe in certain points. Um, the impact on the insurgency is not direct. The drought is not severe in the west. The well above the step in the western oblast that are taken in, but by 1946, the the military aspect of the insurgency has been thoroughly defeated. It's now underground. It's now uh, concerned with assassinations and disruptions. But the real correlation between the insurgency and the suspicion of the, of the Ukrainian peasantry of being allied to it occurs in response to pleas for aid. Because what Kaganovich does in, in March in June 1947 is that he passes a Politburo, even earlier, a Politburo resolution that says any failure to meet sowing targets will be considered an expression of bourgeois Ukrainian nationalism. So what he's doing is he's tying the failures in the sowing campaign or the explanations for the problems to an expression that can be prosecuted through the campaigns. So now nationalism and the threat of the insurgency occurs everywhere, not just in the small parts of Western Ukraine where it's located. It becomes widespread. It becomes a a part of this broader political campaign that affects everyone. So yes, it there's not a direct impact, but indirectly it's quite important. Okay. Um, 
there's up right there first. Um, can we, uh, Philip, can we go back to the map that you showed of population losses? I, I, I can okay. try. <laughs> I, I might have to ask for the support from the um, tech people. Um, what strikes me here is how localized the famine is. Um, if these are, if this is mortality per per thousand in 1947, um, the deaths are occurring in one region. It's not an all Ukrainian all Ukrainian famine in the way that 1933 was remarkable because every district of Ukraine was suffering. So how do you explain these these different? I mean, are what's going on with mass extractions in in other areas of Ukraine? So if we have another map on top of this that would differentiate between urban and rural areas in each oblast, you'd see these red spots in the in the cities that are not being supplied adequately through the grain distribution system. These are annualized over twelve months, and by the entire oblast, and includes the rural and the urban population, is why you see that distinction. But yes, I mean, these are the areas that were worst hit by the drought. And these are the areas where agricultural production collapsed. I mean, in Ismail, for instance, you know, the way they'd measure it in 1945, it was always low, but they might have six or seven centimetres per hectare. And there was a tenth of that in the famine year. I mean, there's there's nothing, there's hardly anything there. Um, and so the people who produce the grain are expected to fend for themselves. Okay, so they're supposed to be paid in cash in the collected farms so they work, they're not, they're usually paid in kind. But the procurements take so much from the farms during this period that there's nothing left to pay them. So there's nothing left to pay them, but they're expected to work or feed themselves from their own small plots of land called plots of mechazesta. Now, okay, but that the drought affects those too. So the, the crops they could expect from those, which are also taxed by the government, are much reduced. And as I explained, in September 1946, there's a massive campaign to reduce the size of these plots because they think, and it's sometimes this is accurate, that they'd expanded beyond the size allowed to them. And when they expand, they take land from a collective farm. So there's less farm in use for state production and there's more in use for personal production. So these areas are being squeezed from all these different directions. And this helps to explain why the, uh, the rate of mortality here in the, in the rural areas is so high. Uh, Elsewhere, the point of them taking food from here is to feed people in the cities. This is always, and for exports and for the military, but this is fundamentally why. They're particularly concerned about Eastern Ukraine and the Donbass, but they can't supply to the extent that they want because there's less than they imagine that exists there. They keep on sending people back and back, saying, oh, there's more grain hiding, there's more, but it doesn't exist. And they've expended so much of their exports earlier through their um, procurements in the previous years here, that this area is so diminished and the people are so diminished that they're subject that they're susceptible to famine more so. In Moldova, we have a food crisis from 1945 where there's a smaller drought. We have a massive typhus outbreak in 1945. These areas don't recover from the ravages of war and occupation to which they've been subject, and then the policies upon reconquest. They're in the worst and most vulnerable positions for post-war shock that comes with famine. And that's what that comes with the drought in the middle of 1956, which is why the extent is so localised. But again, if we had the different map, you'd see how different areas are affected differently. And if I could just sneak in a, a, another yeah. question quickly, and I guess it's to you, Hiroaki. Um, I, I remember reading that um, the Soviet Union was at this time exporting grain to the Eastern Eastern Bloc. Yes. Uh, they, can you talk about the, the levels? Uh, of actually, it was exported to France, uh, Poland, Yugoslavia, and Bulgaria, at least. But these, I mean, certainly, it, it, they cannot justify it. They did it until March or April, May yeah. 1947. Yeah. But so, then for a few months, they stopped. Yeah. Right. So in, um, if you if you look at the exports, most of them given as calendar years. So you'll see 1946, there's so many millions that have, and I think historians have looked at that and said, well, even when the harvest failed, they're still exporting at the same rate. But we can do it by calendar months. 
And what you see is that when they realize the harvest has failed, they reduce the level of exports, but they still keep on until the peak of famine in the spring of 1947, when they stop until September in the same year. So there's a reduction, and there's also a reduction of the Puma target, but it continues. Again, there's, as with the recognition of the failed harvest, there's a recognition that there's an unmistakable drought, but there's never a recognition enough that the policy should change to deal with it. So Upa, yes, makes uh, try to take advantage of this <laughs> and say, well, no, I hear the investment and so on. But in a sense, yes, um, they could have stopped it. They did it. They could have stopped it, yeah. 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 A question here? Yeah. I wonder if you would try to fill in the Moldovan Romanian story for us. I mean, uh, one of the things that struck me when you arrived in, in at least Glacier in the 1990s was of course everyone could tell you what was Zapushti. You know, we, you know, they had a comparative basis, sometimes passed on generationally, sometimes from people who passed it on. Uh, what I'm curious about what the memory of this famine is in Moldova, how it compares to what their memories were of Moldova under Romanian rule, including in the interwar Romanian rule. And and how did that affect uh, their political, cultural, and other? Well, we've we've been going country. to Moldova for the past few years, uh, working in the archives there. And by in, in terms of the severity, by the amount of people in relation to the population, Moldova is the worst affected. I mean, as far as we can calculate, about five percent of its population dies in the country. Um, most of these, if you if you can imagine Moldova, you've got the left bank from the east and the right bank. On the left bank, it's um, it's more collectivised. On the right bank, it's private farmers, much like places like Ismail and Chernitsi in, in Ukraine. In fact, if you were to take off the territorial boundaries and you looked at these places and what they look like, they're much more similar than others. Okay. Um, Kosygin comes to Moldova in uh, March, February, March 1947, on a special mission from Stalin. Like Kagunovich goes to Ukraine. Stalin sends Kosygin to Moldova to figure out whether or not the local um, party organs are telling the truth about the reports on famine that the police are showing. Kosygin, on his first day, reports to Stalin that there is a famine and the local authorities are to blame. Uh, now, I think Stalin accepts that Moldova is an exception. Small, there's only a couple of million people who live there, and he accepts privately that there's a famine there, and they said massive aid in the spring of 1947, a three-month package um, that's quite significant. As far as I can see, a lot of this aid comes from Ukraine. Um, that aid is significant because Sigin is well-remembered in Moldova, um, but when the aid package finishes after three months, it's still two months to the new harvest comes in. So it's, it's quite debatable, but you could say that the aid package helps reduce mass mortality for its duration. But then it's, there's another little spike in June and July before the new harvest comes in. So there was aid, but it was temporary. When the new head of the Moldovan uh, party asks Stalin to continue the aid once Kosygin goes, it doesn't, not to any considerable extent. So again, we have a comparison here to understand why is Moldova treated differently and why, of course, does even this aid not stem the ravages of mass mortality that we see here? They're ongoing questions. Who dies in Moldova most of all? It's a rural population, it's private farmers. There's also an ethnic element. Uh, the Gagauzi, uh, the, um, uh, the sort of ethnic minority in some Moldova, um, we know quite well now that the local uh, party and state bodies refuse to distribute aid here. And rather they, uh, and, and that ethnic element is important to explaining why they were the worst affected population, they decimated. And also can help you understand why their contemporary political orientations in Moldova, to some extent, that's a big part of it. I visited the, um, the, the region just in September and they have a huge commemoration of, of, of the famine in uh, statues and other things as much as possible. 
um, you know, more so than Moldova as a whole. There's a little bit of, of work, and we have a, a colleague who's working on the Moldovan famine as well in uh, Chisinau. Um, but a little bit like Ukraine, the commemorations of it have not been significant. Yeah, as far as the, uh, Romania is concerned, yes, Romania was also yeah, affected. Also. We haven't done much research, as far as I know. But it's interesting to note that uh, quite a few people have moved back to the Soviet Union, like old believers. Western Ukraine, Ukraine people were, ethnic Ukrainians were exchanged by, exchanged for ex ethnic Poles, yeah? the population was taking place. These people are sent to various places to be settled. Of course, they were faced with the famine, and many, many of them wanted to go back to Poland or to Romania. And the Soviet government was very concerned about uh, this re-immigration. So you can imagine what they thought of the, so the reality of Soviet life. And, 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 but no uh, response I would say, uh, what was the interwar history? Had there been a famine in this region before? And did it not create any feeling of saying, under Romania, we never had such a famine. And under the yeah. Soviets, the famine came. Yeah, um, the Soviets were very uh, attentive to uh, Moldovan sympathies to Romania. Um, many Moldovans uh, uh, flee to Romania during the famine over the border, uh, seeking a better seeking a better life. But yes, the, and even now, the, um, the interwar period is, is considered to be one that is um, uh, more promising than, than, than under the Soviets. Yeah. We have a question here? Yes, I wanted to follow up on the Moldovan Romanian connection um, because the Moldova only became part of the Soviet Union during the war. And now at the end of the war, my understanding is that the residents uh, could, ex because they've been Romanian citizens, could exercise their Romanian citizenship or become citizens of the new USSR. Why didn't, what was the population interchange? Why did, in other words, uh, why did they not exercise Romanian citizenship and relocate to Romania? Uh, I, I, I don't know how actual the question about citizenship is. Romania was an occupying power and it had been taken then through the, the Soviets coming through and taking control of it. But many did go, many did seek uh, in Romania, but that was a hard border and that was policed. Uh, uh, so my so, father yeah. uh, was born in Bessarabia. Which part? You know, I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. But I don't think it was in the Transnistria. Yeah. And uh, I, 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 I recall him telling me once, and he'd been, um, I think he was, a, he and my mother, I think, were in a ghetto in Chernev in, in Ukraine. They called it Chernevitz. Yeah. And he said that, and then uh, when it was liberated, uh, he had a Soviet uh, uniform thrown on him, and he spent the last uh, few months of the war uh, guarding Ukrainian trains in the back. Yeah. But he said that at the end of the war, uh, he had he was given the option: he could, if he wanted to exercise his Romanian citizenship, he could relocate to Romania, or become a a citizen of the new yeah. of the USSR, and. From his perspective, and he was anti-communist. Yeah. And from his perspective, conditions, economic conditions, were far superior in, in Romania. Although he had never lived in um, in yeah. in Romania yeah. itself, yeah. so yeah. that so I was wondering if, if I've been a, like him, I yeah. would think, okay, if I'm a, also a Romanian citizenship citizen. It isn't a hard border for me. I can exercise that. Mm. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's certainly interesting that uh, you say that. But part of the part of the issue is that that most of the people there um, who are suffering from famine, their option is less. They can always go you know, try their luck in Romania, but in these areas, what you see is that one of the rare occasions of people actually wanting to join collective farms. Because during the famine, it's intimated to them, of course, that the only way in which they'll receive support is by joining up. 
danger for the Soviets is that they're not in a position to build collective fires because of the broad devastation and their lack of capacity to actually support them. So Khrushchev says um, in dealing with Moldova, because the Moldovans ask him to do it, we're not going to build farms that are going to be poor and be a bad advertisement for collectivization, and they don't do it until so 47, 48. Um, but that's the major option that people are trying to exercise here. Um, and remember, if you're on the left bank of Ukraine, yes, 1940 is the first time that these areas are, are Sovietized, but they're thoroughly Sovietized in 1940 and again in 1945. So you don't have much choice there. On the right bank where you're individual farmers and it's easier to move, perhaps that's the case. But many peasants are attached to their land, uh, yeah. still, so even if you, they have a choice of moving somewhere else, they may not have wanted it. So, are there any more questions from the floor here? If not, um, can we, are there any uh, online questions? We don't see it. I can't see it. Yeah, yeah. I can't see it. Comment, not a question. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I didn't miss a question here. Victor. Uh, yeah, um, I can't hear you. Louder. Um, you said that the people that were occupying the Germans tried to work harder to show their loyalty to the regime to compensate for the potential collaborators. Yeah. yeah. How would you know that? Oh. <laughs> because because the Soviet leaders tell us. Okay. Uh, there's a one, there's a, this is in one of my previous books, I'm trying to remember exactly. So in uh in Hakib in, in late 1943, after it's liberated, the uh there's a, a Ukrainian Communist Party a plenum where the rayon leaders are, are coming uh, before Khrushchev and they're explaining to him how ecstatic they are because they've been taking trains out to, or they've been walking going out to the countryside. And all of the uh, peasants have been coming out and um, uh, greeting them as, as liberators and offering their produce and um, uh, signing up for the loan system, the Zaymi, where they, they give loans for the Red Army in, in, in kind. Um, and, you know, rayon leader after rayon leader comes to Paul Khrushchev and explains to him and says how good this is and so forth. And I'll never forget Khrushchev's response. And he says quite cynically, he said, yes, the Germans taught them to love us. <laughs> Um, you know, this isn't intimated, but the it, it's explicitly discussed as well, but it's also just generally in the way in which, um, you know, the people felt uh, in the leadership towards those areas, which was entirely unfair. The, the scale of the German advance for which the, uh, the Soviets were so woefully unprepared put people in a position where they're overrun and unable to evacuate. Uh, at the at, at the point where they could. Most people who evacuated had the means to evacuate. People in the party and state system, those with capacity. The vast majority, and particularly those with livestock and the countryside, which to some extent has parallels today. I mean, if you're in the Donbass now, you can't just get, you know, your your land and your animals and elderly parents, you can't just get up and, and get in a car and go as easily as someone in the city who has that capacity. Yeah. But, but if, I mean, if, if you uh, it's crucial to comment, it could be taken to the German. We were terrible, but the Germans were even worse. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But also, you were saying that there was like sort of a sly attempt to to, to you know, the peasants to show. Oh, the no, I, would, I wouldn't call. I wouldn't put it sly, <laughs> but it's it's smart because you know they they understood, and you know we have to remember also is that for for, for some people the you know. For some people who've never been under Soviet control or had suffered in the 30s, the reconquest is, is severe. It's the worst thing that can happen to them. Um, for other people for whom the, 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 the genocidal German occupation meant something severely, the Soviets coming back, well, it was better than them. Um, so, and one of the questions we have to ask is what does the famine do the, to these sentiments? If you know, people have, have come to you know, a more positive attitude toward the Soviet Union, give its victory, in the Second World War, what happens when the famine recurs and the memories of the previous one come flooding back? Nothing changes. We're just as bad as we were beforehand. So what does this do to people's attitudes toward the regime as we move into 
you know, the, the Cold War and so forth. There's big questions for us to, to address. Uh, Marta? Uh, we had a chance to talk this week a bit in uh, asking about the how the this famine has been understood in Soviet history until now and why it hasn't been more studied. Um, maybe you could just say a, a little bit more about the what the impact of your work might be on the in the field, or what you hope it'll be, and what's the what's the future of this project? Uh, there's um, a, and, there's, and, and why this famine is so understudied? Yeah, I, there's there's a serious problem in the literature and the consensus which has emerged from it, uh, and that's one thing that we need to be able to to, to demonstrate and correct. So, you know, historiographical sense, that's one of the, the purposes of this. Um, but also because it's 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 the problems with it being understudied, one, because I think of the, the things I discussed earlier, but also because there's a general sense that it's that it's drought. And drought's certainly a big picture, but it's not the only one. And in, in a sense, it's not attracted the same attention, perhaps, as, as a whole lot of more and, and, and others. But it's also at a pivotal point in Soviet history. Now, what what can the famine tell us about how uh, the continuity and discontinuity is between pre and post war Stalinism? Did it change? Did it not? What can we learn from it? These are big. These are these are big questions. Um, but also because the victims are silent. You know, there are a couple of um, document collections coming out of Ukraine um, that have uh, diary entries and letters of memory about 1946, 1947. But most of them die. You know without being registered, recorded in the same sense, and we don't know who they are. And so there's a, there's a deep sense that you know, these people have, or we have some sort of obligation to bring their stories to, to light, uh, in addition to the key historiographical questions that the study helps us address. Okay. Um more follow-up questions, I guess. Uh, on the well, secret police reports, I mean, on, on the attitudes of the, the population. I mean, you had access to Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, more than enough. Yeah. Yeah. I sent many gigabytes to Hero to read, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they you have to treat them critically, but they're very useful. We, yeah, so we do have access to many of them. The best, one of the best um, sources that we have about, and not so much the... Um, the secret police's collation of different opinions and the arguments they're putting to the leadership about what they mean, which is what those reports are. But mail, uh, so surveilled mail. Um, you know, in in one month in 1946, they they uh, surveilled 7,000 letters in Odessa alone, or for oh, sorry for uh, for the first quarter of 1947, and that's all about um, food problems during the famine. And the main concern there, though are military families. So they're all from military families writing to soldiers, wives writing to their husbands who are coming back to Ukraine, come back because we don't have food. And so they should be getting special treatment as military families, but they're not because of the breakdown of the urban rational system. And it's women and dependents who suffer most because they have least capacity to enforce their entitlements. And so those um, sources are very good. Of course, we try and cross-check them as much as possible for place. So if we've got numerous letters from one set of villagers saying that we haven't been paid in the collective farm set and the collective farms for six months, um, then we can try and find uh, reports from the different ministries in these areas in Ukraine to try and understand whether there's been any investigations, whether it's a problem, and usually we can. So we can sort of verify these letters. So in addition to using them to get a sense of that direct access to what people feel and what they think, they can also bring up bigger problems that you might not see in other reports and point you to them by location, which is very important. Um, but most of the security stuff is concerned with the insurgency rather than the food problems of yes, during the family that's there, but the overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority of concern from the Politburo is the insurgency. There are also many intercepted international correspondence. In other words, Ukrainians writing abroad to Poland, yeah. to the US, Canada, and so on. And these were intercepted and then, yes, reported by the secret police to the uh, authorities. And they are very interesting. But we have too many, yeah? yeah. Too many, overwhelming, overwhelming. Some more questions. I have a question about the degree of uh, information control or suppression 
comparing the venom of 46 and 47 with the venom of 48 to 43. Um, obviously, if aid was delivered, then possibly some information would have to be presented in the end, inside or outside. Also, the, the state of, let's say, the statistic, uh, statistical information in the region. How massage was it for 46, 47? Is it uh, reliable for uh, your work as a yes. historian? And is there um, photographic evidence? Uh, we know that in 42, 33, there was a very strict control. There were very few photographs. Is there visual evidence from uh, the events of 46, 47 that were preserved in the archives or the archives? The statistical information is remarkably efficient. Uh, the statistical services, uh, but they need to be treated critically. There's a massive debate in the middle of 1946 between Gosplan um, and uh, local uh, Narkomzag officials in Ukraine about estimates of grain production in the failed harvest. Uh, Voznesensky essentially um, uh, doesn't allow local estimates to be used in grain production targets. They come from Moscow. And of course, there's a wildly unrealistic, while the ones from the local area were more comprehensive, uh, sorry, more accurate. And so we, we, so we have a problem of actually having a difficulty of um, coming up with the grain production uh, totals for 1946 because of this problem. There was a statistical correction in after Stalin's death in 1954 in the statistical uh, services, where they tried to look back at this data and, and come up with a more accurate figure. The problem with us is that by that time, Ismail had been brought into a decimal blast. It was no longer a blast on its own. And so they give total figures. And so we need to break that down by rayon in here. It can be quite difficult. So there is a statistical correction, but the problem is never an accurate estimation or description of what's going on. It's the fact that the leadership chooses to ignore it. Even those from the security services, which they trusted more than the different ministries, which they considered to be you know, pursuing their political objectives. Uh, even those from the security services, when it was clear, it didn't make much of a difference. And for demography mortality? Yeah, so we have um, one of our members on our on our team, Steve Wickrop, but we also have other economic historians and uh, physicists who work with, uh, demographers who work with this data. Yes, the, the, the recorded mortality is outstandingly accurate, accurate and efficient, but it's only a small part of the bigger whole. And making up that bigger whole, that bigger sense, um, is the real challenge. Yeah. And sorry, was there something else? The graphic there? elements, if any? Not as much. There's some in the Moldovan archives, which we have, but in Ukraine, no. But we've um, had this discussion, I think, about more. There might be somewhere I haven't seen, or there might be something else here, but. No, we haven't been able to locate in the many thousands of files we've been no across. There, there might be, we haven't been able to see them. Uh, as far as the other graphic images, there are lots of illustrations in the, in the leaflets, flyers. Uh, oh, that helped me yesterday by Neil Hasevich. Yeah. Neil Hasevich. And other than Shah. There are nice, very interesting illustrations uh, printed on in the propaganda leaflets, yes. There was also a question comparing suppression of, of uh, information for 32, 33. Yeah, uh, and remember too that in uh, where you have foreign correspondents in the major cities, they're less effective. Um, uh, John Steinbeck goes to Kiev, when is it? Is it, is it late 1946 for his tour? And you read his notes and his letters, and you also read the Soviet a secret police's evaluation of his movements in the archives. There's no mention of that. There's no mention of that. They were incredibly, in 46, 47, I think, um, adept at repressing news of it, but they still receive aid from UNRWA that goes to a southern Ukraine, that goes to his mail, tractors, food, packages, others. Um, but again, there's, there's little consideration of this as a separate famine and more continued wartime food problems. If they seek more, then they need to admit that there is a famine occurring, which they won't do. In fact, if you remember, Stalin consistently played down at this time 
the extent of devastation to the so of the Soviet Union to the Western Allies for fear that it would reveal the weakened state that the Soviet Union was in. Right. I think there was a oh, sorry. There was an online question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, there's an online question. Can, I, can everyone see the question to what extent yes. did land destruction destruction of dams reservoirs yes. landmines during the war affect the family? Well, yeah. and as i said during the german retreat the, what's the general estimate they were burning one in every four peasant cottages taking farm implements uh, machinery livestock i mean that has a huge because that's never really recovered until the 50s um you know, the, in Ukraine, the amount of draft animals in use in 1945 were only about 40% of the 1940 level, but you have a growing population coming back in 1946 requiring more food. I don't, not so much landmines and things like that, but it's um, it's the fact that so much land had grown into disuse as, under the German occupation. So uh, usually you think if, if, if land's left fallow, it gives it a rest, it's good, it comes back in a year or two, and it could be used for better agricultural production. But things like weeds take over, and the lack of tractors to plough it means that it's very hard to get this land back into circulation. The challenges of agricultural reconstruction, particularly faced during a, a period of demographic loss, where women fundamentally in 1945, 1944, are the chief agricultural workers without tractor power or draft power. I mean, it's enormous. It's, it's difficult to comprehend how you know after a period of terrible occupation they're able to at least make the small successes that they do in reconstruction without much support at all from the central authorities Frank, uh, uh, just to clarify um these various policies towards countryside and cities and and starvation and how much of this region is really controlled by the romanians during the war, yeah. what their policy is. Yeah. And I would assume, I mean, my assumption has always been that if you lived even in the uh, Reichskommissariat, uh, the cities were being hit worse than the countryside so that a peasant could see you, I'm probably slightly better off than if I, if I was in a town under the Germans. Uh, is that so? And not, and not, how does not, that not, apply? Not if you're being mobilized for labor in Germany. Yeah, well, <laughs> which you sometimes thought was a good thing, right? In well, many cases. I mean, well, there's other people who go to Germany yeah, go fairly ha happily. And I take it at quite the a few. At the beginning. Yeah, and yeah. quite a few farm uh, uh, community. But the other is the differences of, of the territory under the Romanians. Yes. Okay. And does that leave a different uh, attitude towards it and then affect how people relate to the yeah. climate? So if you remember, the Romanians occupy the southern steppe all, all, almost up to Kherson, yeah. they go all the way up there. Um, and yeah, for people they consider to be ethnic Moldovans, life's pretty good. Remember, uh, you know, Odessa is the cultural capital of Romanian occupation. Mm. Um, if you're an ethnic Ukrainian living there, you're treated on the bottom rung of the hierarchy. So, but yes, generally conditions there are much better than in German occupied territory, much better. Um, uh, for and for peasants, yes, uh, particularly those who, as I said before, generally in the procurements under occupation, um, are being taxed a little bit less than when the Soviets come yeah, back. When the Soviets come, when the Soviets come back, but yeah. when the Romanians leave, the massive removal of everything of value as much as they can hold puts these people in, in, in these in a very difficult position once they're gone. Mm. Um, and you know, they take a lot of people with them too to Romania as forced labor, not just animals. They take and people and some go and some go because they're fearful. Yeah. If life had been good under the Romanians, they would have to explain that to the, to the Soviets. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. I did want to give, um, Philip, a chance because I think it'll be of interest to people, some people in this room. Yeah. A plug for your upcoming book. Oh, well, that's on a slightly different topic. It's yeah. on um, the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, Commissar for Education, Alexander Shumsky, in the 1920s. A fascinating man who, like so many of his contemporaries, was purged in the early 1930s during the massive attack on Ukraine's cultural and political elite. 
Unlike them, though, um, despite interrogations and trials and for over a decade, refused to uh, admit and confess to the charges laid against him. This paralyzed him, and he um, is a fascinating story because uh, the Soviet state doesn't really know what to do with him. Uh, they're trying to commit him to trial so they can execute him, but they want that elusive confession, which they can't get. And it's a study that sort of tackles the question of what happens when the vast machinery of oppression comes to a fork in the road. How does it deal with it? How does it not? Um, how does Barry and so forth, when they're discussing his case, uh, what does it tell us about the way in which Soviet repression works? And what does it tell us about the fate of someone like this who, despite being paralysed and gravely ill, refused, uh, not only refused to confess and play along with the confession game, but but launches a massive attack, uh, sorry, a protest for his own political rehabilitation. Um, he launches a protest again in 1945 against Stalin's toast to the Russian people as the greatest ethnicity in the Soviet Union and responsible for the war. And he writes a suicide letter to Stalin, blaming him for the failures in the nationalities policy and speaking to him in such a way that no other Soviet citizen, I imagine, would ever put pen to paper to speak to him. Um, he fails to commit suicide. He does it twice. He tries, but he's very ill, so he, he doesn't die as a result. Uh, and we trace in the latter parts of the book the plans by Stalin and his entourage uh, about how to assassinate him. They assassinate him shortly by allowing him passage to Ukraine, for which he'd been asking for many years, so he could die in his homeland, uh, under the pretext of allowing him to go so they can... Um, uh, kill him in his railway carriage on the way. Um, and for those interested in contemporary actions of the Russian secret police, it's one of the first times that they use radioactive poison to kill one of their enemies uh, in 1946. But it's a it's a biography of some. It's a it's a, it's a rewriting of well, sort of the, the the experience of the Ukrainian elite under Soviet oppression through the biography of a very unique case that, that tells us a lot about what's happening. But I, yeah, thanks, Martin, I'll just speak about that. Yeah, very good. Okay, I think we're just about run out of time and I wanted to thank our two uh, guests from uh, um, far away Australia and also from the United States for uh, coming up here and for uh, organizing, well, for uh, initiating this uh, session. And thank you for inviting me and uh, Thank you, everybody, for coming out for this event.